Our series is called It's Not Too Late, and we're looking at some folks who got toe up from the flow up and whom God still did something with, where things weren't going right, and God was able to turn it around. Today I want to talk about Jonah, the rebel God used. Jonah is one of those intriguing minor prophets. Four short chapters encompasses his book, and the word came to him. Verse 2 of chapter 1, to arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord, went down to Joppa, found a ship, that was going to Tarshish, paid the fare, went down into it to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. We're looking at a rebel here, a man who didn't like what God told him to do. Now you have to understand why Jonah did not want to go to Nineveh. When you get a chance, read another minor prophet called Nahum. Because the book of Nahum is God's judgment against Nineveh. The Ninevites were a very violent people who showed no mercy to their enemies. They would kill you and then put your dead body on display to show their might and their bloodthirstiness. So Jonah is being real practical here. You want me to go to Nineveh? They kill people in Nineveh. You cannot want me to go there. In fact, don't send me there to judge them. Judge them. <laughs> you don't need me to tell them. You don't have to tell them nothing. Kill them. There's a second reason he didn't want to go to Nineveh. He was scared that they might get saved. And then you won't judge them. Because then they're your children. So these are folk who don't deserve saving. So if they don't get saved, they might kill me. If they get saved, then you're not going to judge them. And they're the arch enemy of my people Israel. So I don't want them delivered. I'm not going to do it. In fact, I'm going the other direction. He says twice in verse 3 that Jonah fled to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Now, Jonah is a prophet. He knows that God is everywhere. He doesn't think that he can like run from God in the sense that, that God is not going to be where he's going. But he's running from God's expectations, God's demands, God's requirements. He, he does not want to do what God wants him to do, so he's going to go in the opposite direction of what God expects. He would rather be, watch this, 2,500 miles out of God's will than 550 miles in it. He says, I'm going the other way. I'm going so that even if you find me, God, it'll be too late for me to help them. I am leaving. I'm gone. To run from the presence of God is to run in the opposite direction of the will of God. So God has told his prophet, his preacher, I, want, I have an assignment for you. I have a will for you. I have a design for you. I have a desire for you. And this is what I want you to do. There are probably some people here today who are running from the presence of God. In other words, God has given you a word. Maybe it came through a sermon, maybe it came directly from the Bible, maybe it came some, from some spiritual influencer in your life, and he's told you, this is what I want you to do, but you don't like it. It's not your preferred course of action. You've got logical reasons why God does not know what he's talking about, and there's too much risk in doing it God's way. Therefore, you run from the presence of the Lord. You run from his will. Some people, unlike those of you who are here today, when they get ticked off at God or what God demands or expects, they run from the presence of the Lord, they stop going to church. Perhaps, you know, people in your sphere of influence say, I don't go to church anymore because they don't want what God demands or expects. And so not to even put themselves in a position to hear it, to be reminded of it, or to be in the environment that reinforces it, they stop going to church altogether because they don't want to be in his presence. They don't want to be reminded of his divine expectation. So, he says, I'm not going, I'm not going to do it, God. Find you somebody else. 
Please notice in the middle of verse 3, he went down to Joppa, found a ship that was going to Tarshish, paid the fare, went down with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Please notice he went down to Joppa because whenever you run from God, you got to go down. Down is the only direction you can go. If you going away from God, you need to know while you think you going up, you headed down. He went down to Tarshish. You are sinking fast, although it may not be immediately evident. So you can run from God's will and for a while it looked like it's okay. You just going down and don't know it yet. Please notice something else. He not only went down, but he paid the fare. He not only went down, but he paid the fare. You see, whenever you run from God, you must pick up the tab. Whenever you run from God, you got to pay for the trip of deserting his presence. See, when you're in God's will, even if you don't like God's will, God will pick up the tab. See, if your company sends you on a trip, then they're responsible for paying your way. Now, when you go to your trip, when you go on your vacation, the company ain't picking that up. They, 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 that's you. You must pay that. You remember Moses' mother, Jochebed, her son, was life was in jeopardy. She put him in the Nile River. Pharaoh's daughter found her in the Nile River, picked him up. But the problem is she needed a nursemaid. Miriam's Moses' sister went back to Moses' mother, said, look, they're looking for a nursemaid for our, your son, my brother, Moses. Why don't you apply for the job? So Jochebed, Moses' mother, who put him in the Nile River, applied for the job to be his nursemaid and Exodus chapter 2 verse 9 says that uh, Pharaoh's daughter, she hires Moses' his mother, and then it says, and paid to raise him. So she got paid to raise her own son. Because when you're in the will of God, God picks up the tab. When you're on your own, you've got to pay for it yourself. So he goes down and he pays the fare in order to run from God. Running from God costs you. It costs you time, it can cost you money, it can cost you health, it can cost you peace, it can cost you joy, it can cost you a sense of well-being, it can cost you progress, it can cost you unity, it can cost you harmony, it can cost you mental stability. Running from God causes you a tab that you must yourself pay. He pays the fare to run from God. Verse 4 tells us, the Lord hurled a great wind on the sea, and there was a great storm on the sea, so that the ship was about to break up. All right. Jonah made his decision. Then God made his. Jonah said, God, I'm running. God said, Jonah, I'm hurling. Jonah said, God, I'm going in the other direction. God says, don't find you. God hurls a great wind targeted toward Jonah. The Bible says, whom the Lord loveth, he skinneth alive. It's basically Hebrews 12. Uh, whom the Lord loveth, he disciplines. Whom the Lord loveth, he spanketh. Whom the Lord loveth, he corrects. Listen, if you claim to be a Christian and are in rebellion and God ain't coming after you, you must be somebody else's kid. Because whom the Lord loveth, he comes after it. It's not a word, but you know what I'm saying. Okay, one of God's great proofs is that when you rebel, he will not leave you alone. Watch this now. He will create a storm with your name on it. This was a Jonah storm. Because the storm only came because Jonah was rebelling. If you are in rebellion, that is refusing to do the will of God, going 2,500 miles out of God's will, then going 550 miles in it because you don't like it, expect bad weather. It's a storm. If you are a son or daughter of God and are in rebellion against God, you are a spiritual rebel and your heavenly father loves you too much not to come after you. But when he comes after you, things get stormy. The sailors were in trouble because the rebel was on board. 
So they're all panicky, wondering why is this storm killing us? But look at Jonah at the end of verse 5. Jonah had gone below and the hold of the ship lay down and fallen asleep. How are you going to fall asleep in a storm when the ship is breaking up? That means you're so far out of the will of God when you can sleep through a storm that's designed to discipline you. Everybody else is panicking, throwing things overboard, scared, crying, and afraid. He snoring. That ain't normal. He goes down, because remember, he's already going down to Joppa. He goes down to the hole of the ship. He gets as far away by himself as he can get because he doesn't want to deal with God. The people here today who don't want to deal with God. You're in church, but you don't want to deal with God. Because you don't like how he runs things. You don't like what he says. You don't like what he expects. We see it all the time in counseling. People come, they want help, but they don't want to hear from God. They want the kind of help that they want, not the kind of help that God demands. And so they run from the presence of God. I ain't coming back to y'all no more. Even if the advice is based on divine guidelines. So he is resting out of God's will. You can be out, you can be out of God's will so long and get so comfortable that you can sleep through it. I see some head nodding right now. You're sleeping through it. Now watch this now. So the captain, verse 6, comes to Jonah and he has a little, a little, a little basic, simple question. How is it that you are sleeping? I don't understand this. Get up. Call on your God. Perhaps your God will be concerned about us so that we will not perish. Okay, this is so funny. He comes down to the sleeping prophet who's the cause of all this mess. And he can't believe that this guy could sleep in a storm like this and break it up the boat. That's a wicked storm. Jonah's the preacher, right? The captain is a sinner. He's not a saint because it says all of them called on their own gods. So the sinner is telling the preacher, would you mind praying? Don't you think prayer would be a good idea right now? We as men can get so far out of the will of God that our wives have to ask us to pray. Right? Calm down, calm down. So, he said, pray, do something. So they cast lots in verse 7 to find out who's the cause of this. See, these men were why. They understood that maybe we're in a storm because of a spiritual problem and just not because of meteorological changes in the atmosphere. A lot of times, as believers, we're sleeping through what God is doing. So we don't connect it with God. Hear the sinners say, maybe God got something to do with this. So let's call on God. So they go to Jonah and they say, who are you? He tells them in verse 9, I'm a Hebrew. Oh, now he's spiritual. I fear the Lord God of heaven who made the sea and the dry land. Your God made the sea. The one that's going to kill us, that was your God. We have issues. They became extremely frightened. How could you do this? He said, I was running from the presence of the Lord. He told them, I was running from the presence of the Lord. The reason you're in this storm is God is tracking me down. And, and they want to know, how are you going to do this? How are you going to mess up us? Because you want to be a fool. At least if you're going to be a fool, be a fool by yourself. Don't, don't be bringing your stuff on me. Okay, you, you're just messing up everybody because you won't be a fool. Running from God. So running from God has created a stormy situation for him and those who are in association or proximity to him. He says, well, there's a solution. Verse 12. Pick me up and throw me into the sea. Oh, he's not only a rebel prophet, he crazy. The man is crazy. He gets so far out of the will of God, he's willing to commit suicide. Kill me. Kill me. I'm, I'm, I'm willing to die. I'd rather die in the sea than go to Nineveh. I so not like what God asked me to do. Kill me. In fact, you will see throughout the book, it's only four short chapters. The man want to die every other chapter. 
the chapter, the man wants to die. I mean, you know people like that. Oh, it's time for me to go home. He wants to die every other chapter because he doesn't like what God is doing. And I'd rather die than do what God says. So he says, if you kill me, you throw me overboard, you let me drown, then everything will be okay for you because your storm is spiritual, not meteorological. Well, the men didn't want to commit murder. So they rode desperately, verse 13, to try to get to land. But they could not, for the sea was becoming even stormier against them. But where it gets interesting is in verse 14. They called on the Lord and said, we earnestly pray, O Lord, do not let us perish on account of this man's life and do not put innocent blood on us, for you, O Lord, have done as you have pleased. So they picked up Jonah, threw him into the sea, because things kept getting worse, and the sea stopped its raging. It says, they say, look, okay, God, if this is the man and you're trying to get us to do something with him, then we're going to throw him overboard. We don't want to do this. We tried to roll, but things got worse. We're going to throw him overboard. And they prayed earnestly to God. And then after they threw him overboard, it says the men greatly feared the Lord and offered sacrifices and made vows. To put it in New Testament language, the sailors who started off praying to different gods are now praying to Jonah's God. They praying to the only true God. In other words, the sailors get saved. That shows you something about God. Even in our rebellion, God can still do his work. Even in our rebellion, God can still do his work. So, Jonah's been thrown overboard because he's still in rebellion. He's going to die before he does God's will. Well, verse 17. And the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was in the stomach of the fish three days and three nights. Don't misread that. It doesn't say God created a great fish. It says he appointed a great fish. In other words, God came to a great fish and said, I got a fool drowning over here and I need you to go pick him up. And the fish said, yes, Lord. All right. The fish says, your will, I will obey. The fish is doing what the preacher wasn't doing. Then Jonah prayed. And in chapter two is Jonah's prayer of repentance. It is his prayer of repentance. He says in verse 7, when I was fainting away, I remembered the Lord and my prayer came to you in your holy temple. God trapped him, sent a whalogram after him and trapped him, put him in a place that drove him to call on the name of the Lord. God will create a storm, put you in a compartment you can't break out of until you decide to look up. And stop going down, 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 down. He calls on the Lord and then, watch this, his circumstance changes. He gets vomited up on dry land. There's only one piece of dry land we've run into. That's Joppa. Joppa was where he got on the boat and paid, I'm going somewhere. Joppa is where he got on the boat, paid the fare to run from the will of God, right? So if the fish is taking him back to dry land, but the Bible's going to say then he still had to go to Nineveh, guess where the fish is taking him back to? His point of disobedience. (laughs) To say, which way you going today, Jonah? You going to buy another ticket to Tarshish or have we reconsidered our position here? (laughs) Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time. Jonah, in case you missed me the first time, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and proclaim to it the proclamation which I am going to tell you. In other words, I'm not going to give you the rest of the information until I see which way you're going. See, a lot of us say, Lord, give me the details and then I'll let you know whether I'm going to go. God is saying go, then I'll give you the details. Because God is trying to teach us to walk by faith, not by sight. And if he gave you all the details to negotiate... So, he goes out and preaches. In 40 days, then it will be destroyed. The people repent. The king repents. He tells the nobles to repent. Who would have thought that a simple gospel message would turn a whole city around? 
Guess what Jonah was running from? He was running from leading the greatest evangelistic movement in the history of mankind because he didn't like what God said do. Guess what you and I might be missing on? You and I, in rebelling against God, may be missing out on one of the greatest moves of God our lives have ever had that we don't get to see because we insist on Tarshish rather than Nineveh because we don't like what God says. Today I want to talk about Jonah, the rebel God used. Jonah is a prophet of God. And the word came to him. Verse 2 of chapter 1. To arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Went down to Joppa, found a ship that was going to Tarshish, paid the fare, went down into it to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. We're looking at a rebel here, a man who didn't like what God told him to do. Has God ever said something to you to do and you ain't like it? You weren't into his request, demand, or expectation. God has asked Jonah to do something incredible. Now you have to understand why Jonah did not want to go to Nineveh. The Ninevites were a very violent people who showed no mercy to their enemies. They would kill you and then put your dead body on display to show their might and their bloodthirstiness. So Jonah is being real practical here. You want me to go to Nineveh? They kill people in Nineveh. You cannot want me to go there to talk to them. In fact, don't send me there to judge them. Judge them. You don't need me to tell them. You don't have to tell them nothing. Kill them. But the second reason he didn't go to Nineveh is that he was scared that they might get saved. And then you won't judge them. Because they're your children. Verse 4 tells us, The Lord hurled a great wind on the sea, and there was a great storm on the sea, so that the ship was about to break up. If you are in rebellion, that is refusing to do the will of God, going 2,500 miles out of God's will, then going 550 miles in it because you don't like it, expect bad weather. It's a storm. If you are a son or daughter of God and are in rebellion against God, you are a spiritual rebel and your heavenly father loves you too much not to come after you. But when he comes after you, things get stormy. Weather gets windy. Circumstances get shaky because you are outside of the direction God wants you to go. It says the ship is about to break up. The sailors become afraid. Now these are professional sailors. Their job is to take cargo from Joppa to Tarshish and take cargo from Tarshish back to Joppa. This was their living. And their living is getting ready to go underwater. Because verse 5 says they threw their cargo off. That means they lose money. They can't take care of their family. Why? Because when you're in rebellion, you affect people associated with you. See, the sailors were in trouble because the rebel was on board. Now watch this now. So the captain, verse 6, comes to Jonah, and he has a little basic, simple question. How is it that you are sleeping? I don't understand this. Get up! Call on your God. Perhaps your God will be concerned about us so that we will not perish. He said, I was running for the presence of the Lord. The reason you're in this storm is God is tracking me down. And, and they want to know, how are you going to do this? How are you going to mess up us? Because you want to be a fool. At least if you're going to be a fool, be a fool by yourself. Don't, don't be bringing your stuff on me. Okay, you, you're just messing up everybody because you won't be a fool. 
running from God. So running from God has created a stormy situation for him and those who are in association or proximity to him. He says, well, there's a solution. Verse 12, pick me up and throw me into the sea. I'd rather die in the sea than go to Nineveh. I so not like what God asked me to do, kill me, then everything will be okay for you because your storm is spiritual, not meteorological. Well, the men didn't want to commit murder, so they rode desperately, verse 13, to try to get to land. But they could not, for the sea was becoming even stormier against them. So the sinner is trying to help out the saint. That we don't want to kill you. I know you want to die. We don't want to kill you. We're going to get to land. Let's work like dogs. They work like the harder they work to get him to help, the harder God worked to keep him in the storm. It got stormier. But where it gets interesting is in verse 14. They called on the Lord and said, we earnestly pray, O Lord, do not let us perish on account of this man's life and do not put innocent blood on us. For you, O Lord, have done as you have pleased. So they picked up Jonah, threw him into the sea because things kept getting worse. And the sea stopped its raging. In other words, when they got rid of the sinner or the sinning prophet, the storm changed. The men feared the Lord greatly and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. To put it in New Testament language, the sailors who started off praying to different gods are now praying to Jonah's God. Even in our rebellion, God can still do his work. So, Jonah's been thrown overboard because he's still in rebellion. He's going to die before he does God's will. Well, verse 17. And the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was in the stomach of the fish three days and three nights. Don't misread that. It doesn't say God created a great fish. It says he appointed a great fish. In other words, God came to a great fish and said, I got a fool drowning over here and I need you to go pick him up. And the fish said, yes, Lord. All right. The fish says, your will I will obey. The fish is doing what the preacher wasn't doing. He's going to submit to God because he was operating by appointment. See, that's very important to know that God controls nature. Jonah thought he was going to die. God ain't, wasn't finished with him yet. You ain't dying yet because I told you to go to Nineveh. I ain't tell you die today. <laughs> then Jonah prayed. And in chapter two is Jonah's prayer of repentance. It is his prayer of repentance. He says in verse seven, when I was fainting away, I remembered the Lord and my prayer came to you in your holy temple. God trapped him, sent a whalogram after him and trapped him, put him in a place that drove him to call on the name of the Lord. God will create a storm, put you in a compartment you can't break out of until you decide to look up and stop going down, 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 down. He forced him upwards. It was at his lowest point, trapped in a situation he couldn't get out of, that he cried unto the Lord. After he cried to the Lord, verse 10, somebody say then. Yeah. See, we got a lot of thens here. Then the Lord commanded the fish and it vomited Jonah up on dry land. Okay, follow this now. Jonah's going down to Joppa because he's catching a boat to Tarshish because he's not about to do what God says do because what God's talking about doesn't make sense. Finally, he calls on the Lord and then, watch this, his circumstance changes. He gets vomited up on dry land. There's only one piece of dry land we've run into. That's Joppa. Joppa was where he got on the boat and paid, I'm going somewhere. Joppa is where he got on the boat, paid the fare to run from the will of God, right? So if the fish is taking him back to dry land, but the Bible's gonna say then he still had to go to Nineveh, guess where the fish is taking him back to? His point of disobedience takes him back to his point of departure to say, which way are you going today, Jonah? 
You gonna buy another ticket to Tasha's or have we reconsidered our position here? He vomits him up on dry land and the only dry land has been Joppa. And he still gotta decide if he's going to Nineveh. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time. Oh, that's good news. And the good news is God will repeat himself. Jonah, in case you missed me the first time, let me say it again. Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and proclaim to it the proclamation which I am going to tell you. In other words, I'm not going to give you the rest of the information until I see which way you're going. See, a lot of us say, Lord, give me the details and then I'll let you know whether I'm going to go. God is saying go, then I'll give you the details. So Jonah went to Nineveh, a great city. It took him three days to walk the city. And he began to go through the city one day's walk and cried out. Yet 40 days and Nineveh will be destroyed. So he's walking around the city. Yet 40 days and Nineveh will be destroyed. God says yet 40 days and Nineveh will be destroyed. Now that's good news and bad news. The bad news is Nineveh is going to be destroyed. The good news is you got 40 days to reverse it. God's discipline and God's judgment is bad news and good news. The bad news is it's getting ready to hurt. The good news is you've got the opportunity to reverse it. You know, that's what repentance is. Repentance is giving God the opportunity to reverse his discipline or his judgment. If you're in rebellion against God right now, and nothing has happened yet. That means time has not yet run out. So he goes out and preaches. In 40 days, Nineveh will be destroyed. Now watch this. Verse 5. The people of Nineveh believed in God. They called a fast and put sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. When the word reached the king of Nineveh, he arose from his throne, laid aside his robe from him, covered himself with sackcloth and sat on ashes. He issued a proclamation and said, In Nineveh, by the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let man, beast, herd, or flock taste the thing. Do not let them eat or drink water. But both man and beast must be covered with sackcloth and let men call on God earnestly that each may turn from his wicked way and from the violence which is in his hand who knows God may turn and relent and withdraw his burning anger so we will not perish unbelievable unbelievable we just heard in chapter one God say how wicked the city was right then on top of that the king talks about how violent they were the book of Nahum talks about how violent the people are This is the only time in the Bible and the only time to my knowledge in human history where a whole city gets saved at the same time. That has never, ever happened before. This is the greatest revival in human history. The people repent. The king repents. He tells the nobles to repent. And then he tells them all, make your animals repent. He said, I want the dog on its knees. I want the cow on its knees. I want the bull on its knees. I want the animals to repent. Put the animals in sack on that. We want to let God know we serious. Who would have thought that a simple gospel message, 40 days, and none of them will be destroyed, would turn a whole city around. Guess what Jonah was running from? He was running from leading the greatest evangelistic movement in the history of mankind because he didn't like what God said do. Guess what you and I might be missing on? You and I in rebelling against God may be missing out on one of the greatest moves of God our lives have ever had that we don't get to see because we insist on Tarshish rather than Nineveh because we don't like what God says. Listen, when God tells you to do something you don't like, it's going to be worth the trip because he's going to pick up the tab. He would have never thought. Now, if God would have said, Jonah, I want you to go to Nineveh because we're going to have one of the greatest revivals in the history of mankind. You're going to lead it. Your name is going to go down in history as the preacher who preached the message that delivered everybody at one time, which has never happened in human history. 
And Jonathan said, hey, hey, I am the man. You know? But then that wouldn't have been walking by faith. Listen, God does not always explain himself in advance. In fact, he rarely does. You have to walk by faith first to see what he's up to. Jonah has issues. He's got emotional problems. It greatly displeased Jonah and he became angry. Now, how are you going to be ticked off when a whole town gets saved? That don't even sound right. He's angry. Verse 2 explains. He prayed to the Lord and said, please, Lord, was not this what I said while I was in my own country? Therefore, in order to forestall this, I fled to Tarshish. For I knew that you are gracious and a compassionate God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, and one who relents concerning calamity. Now, therefore, please take my life for me, for death is better to me than life. Okay, he's a fool. He's crazy. He is saying... All these people getting saved, I don't want none of them in heaven. Kill me. (laughs) Kill me. This man has a death witch. He's getting angry that people get saved. But you know, when I think about it, there may be some people in your life you get ticked off if they get saved. Or my life. No, if they get saved, then I got to treat them like a brother or a sister. I ain't treating them like nothing. Don't get them saved. But it also means the people who you think could never get saved could be on the verge if they heard from you. Jonah would never have thought these people would have responded. They were too evil. But you never know what God's doing on the inside while you and I are silent on the outside. That may be a cousin, a brother-in-law, a neighbor, a friend, a co-worker who's on the verge of eternity and God has said, open up your mouth and we stay silent. And they could be on the verge of turning to God. Well, he wants God to take his life. And God raises a great psychological question in verse 4. Do you have good reason to be angry? Just because you're mad, don't make it right. In chapter 12 of Matthew, in closing, we see these words. Matthew chapter 12, verse 38. Then some of the scribes and Pharisees said to him, we want to see a sign from you. But he said to them, an evil and adulterous generation craves for a sign, and yet no sign will be given to it but the sign of Jonah the prophet. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the sea monster, So will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will stand up with this generation at the judgment and will condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And behold, someone greater than Jonah is here. First of all, this proves that Jonah is a real story in the Bible because Jesus said it was. So if Jonah is not a real story, Jesus is a liar. If Jesus is a liar, he's not the Son of God. If he's not the son of God, we don't have a savior. If we don't have a savior, we're going to die in our sins. The reason that Jonah is true is Jesus said it's true. We've established the Old Testament where we find the story being verified by Jesus Christ as part of the word of God. But then he makes another closing point. And here's what he says. He says, you want a sign? And I just did a miracle. He just... Open the man's eyes and help the man who couldn't talk to talk. But they said, that ain't enough. Do something else. He said, look, you just evil. Y'all not looking for a sign.
You just want another reason to reject me. But I'm going to give you one more sign. Just as Jonah was in the belly of the fish, I'm going to be in the belly of the earth. And when Jonah came out, he brought about repentance in Nineveh. In other words, things changed when Jonah came out of the fish. When I come out of the earth, a greater than Jonah is here. Now here's the good news for you and me. If a rebel preacher can turn a Nineveh around, then sure enough, Jesus Christ can turn you around. If a rebel preacher can take evil Nineveh and make it better, sure enough, one who died and rose from the dead can take evil you and me and make us better. If Jonah could do that, as messed up psychologically as he was. How much can Jesus Christ do as psychologically balanced and sane as he is? If that Old Testament madman could do all that, then this New Testament son of God man can do so much more. Jesus Christ can change you because Jonah could change Nineveh and guess what? A greater than Jonah is here. Jesus Christ is here to reverse the circumstances in your life. If you're ready for that kind of change in your life, here's Dr. Evans to talk about how it happens and doesn't happen. You're not a Christian because you're religious or because you go to church or even because you believe in God. You're a Christian because you've accepted Jesus Christ as your personal sin bearer. Being religious, doing good works, that's nice, but it's not sufficient when God demands perfection. Second Corinthians 5.21 says, He who knew no sin became sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So what God has said is, he placed your sin on the cross, on the Christ, and then judged Christ for your sin. If you will go to Christ, he will take Christ's righteousness, which is perfect, and he will credit it to your account. So you will stand before God as though you've never sinned, not because you're sinless, but because you've got a sinless credit on your account. If you will receive Jesus Christ right now, if you will invite him into your life, believing that he died for you and rose for you personally, he will credit your account with perfection because he's already credited your sin on the Jesus Christ. So go to Christ right now and get